So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Machine Learning and Physics Seminar Series. Um, if you have a question uh, during the talk, uh, Ben said he's happy to either take them at the start or at the end, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so just for your information, the seminar is recorded and will be added to the uh, YouTube channel afterwards. Um, today's talk will be given by Dr. Ben Nachman, uh, the Chamberlain Fellow at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and an expert on machine learning and particle physics. Uh, today, here we will talk about how the machine learning tools can be used to challenge the current data analysis paradigm. Um, so Ben, uh, please go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to tell you about uh, extracting most from collider data with deep learning. So I, I should <coughs> start by, um, well, first I should say, ask if you can see my slides advance and you can hear me, just to confirm. Uh, I can see them. Um, if you don't, please uh, please shout. Fantastic. Very good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I should start with the science goals of collider physics, because I understand this is a broader physics audience, um, although I recognize some familiar names um, uh, in, the, in the audience. And so, yeah, the, this is a, an event display of a proton-proton collision from the ATLAS experiment, where you see the protons going in from the left and the right, and out goes uh, uh, the, the collision debris. And this is going to be... Um, the, the example that I'm going to, recurring example that I'm going to use throughout the rest of this talk, although a lot of the techniques will have um, broader use cases. So the, the, the goal of particle physics has, there are many goals of particle physics, trying to understand the fundamental uh, uh, structure and emergent properties um, thereof for in, in nature. And these are sort of the big, some of the big questions that we have. And I think they're in common with other areas of particle physics and other areas of fundamental physics. And this will be like the backdrop for, for the, the goals for why we want to do all of the, the science I'm going to talk about. And I want to take a step back and think about how we do data analysis in, in high energy physics as a way to describe why we need new tools. So the, the ultimate goal, of course, is to infer something about the theory of everything. And to do that, we have these sort of parallel tracks. There's nature. We build an experiment to observe nature. Um, that experiment allows us to, to observe some features, which we then uh, do some dimensionality reduction. And the goal is to do sort of a similar track uh, on the theory side. So we have our theory, we have uh, an input into a simulator, we can simulate all of the um, high energy physics, the nuclear physics, the detector physics that allows us to um, basically produce a very similar set of observables from the same dimensionality reduction procedure and then compare in order to infer something about um, nature um, through this, through this um, uh, dual, dual chain. Now deep learning is making a, a big splash in all areas of these two chains, both on the experimental side from the lowest level, so from online processing and quality control, um, all the way to data curation, which includes things like calibration, um, particle identification, et cetera. Um, then even, of course, the traditional use of machine learning in, in energy physics, which is sort of at the pattern recognition uh, uh, stage to compare, say, signal and background of different processes. But it's also making a big impact on the theory side as well. So uh, the left arrow going from theory to simulation that's um, you know, being uh, explored in the context of, of augmenting or accelerating simulations or phase-based um, generation going backwards is trying to use the output of our simulators to infer some parameters um, of the theory of everything. So I don't have time to talk about the impact of deep learning on all these areas, so I'm going to focus on um, just a few for today. And in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, simulation, uh, uh, simulation based inference to explore the full phase space of our data. Then I'll uh, have an intermezzo where I'll talk about uncertainties. And then the last part of the talk will be about um, learning directly from unlabeled data in the context of anomaly detection. So let me start with parameter estimation and uh, unfolding. So this is this inference, this inference step. And the backdrop of this um, challenge is going to be that in low dimensions, we can try to learn, we can try to model ex explicitly some density, so say like I have some features x, some parameters, and I want to be able to infer p of x given, want to infer parameters given x, so I can write down this density uh, sometimes. In higher dimensions, um, it's just never possible, so p is intractable, and so we need approaches which are likelihood free, don't require me to write down this explicit density. And I think this is a real big challenge, and uh, I call this the, the hyper challenge. So it's, it's a hyper challenge for two reasons. Um, so one is that the phase space we're trying to explore is very high dimensional. So a typical collision at the, LH, the Large Hadron Collider, for instance, might produce thousands of particles. Each of those particles has a four vector and other numbers, quantum numbers and other numbers, um, which then spans a dynamically sized high dimensional feature space. 
and this is sort of sort of shown schematically in the bottom right, which this picture not to scale shows, you know, quarks and gluons inside proton scattering, and you have this huge mass of um, quarks and gluons that form these green circles, which are hadrons that we want to learn something about. And those hadrons are then measured by uh, basically a hyperspectral camera. And so the data that we get at the end of the day, which are represented by these yellow blobs and curved uh, lines, correspond to you know, the readout from say millions of readout channels. And, and while we use dimensionality reduction to not you know, use the full hundred, you know, hundreds of millions of uh, input data points, we, it's still a very large phase space. So there's this challenge and opportunity of coupling this high dimensional um, phase space with a, a, a high dimensional data um, uh, size. And, and so let's, let me take one example. Um, and so one example in the context of parameter estimation um, is gonna be unfolding. And we call unfolding high energy physics. Some, in other areas, people call this deconvolution. The idea is that we measure the right hand sides, so we measure the output in our detector, and we want to infer the full spectrum of particles that would have hit the detector. So we measure the right, want to know the left. Um, and if we knew the density, so if we knew the probability of measured given true, we could simply maximize the likelihood, and we could declare the result, the unfolded result, um, as the true value that, that maximized this, this density. Now, that would be great. However, uh, I just told you that the challenge is that the measured um, uh, space is hu huge, it's hyperspectral, and the true is, is hypervariant, so it's huge phase space. So P of measured given true is intractable. We can't, we can't write it down explicitly. One thing we can do, and we have a, a huge um, resource available to us, is that we can simulate. So we can um, run in forward mode, we can sample from this distribution, we can sample from measured given true, and this allows us to do simulation based or something called likelihood free inference in this context. So let me show you, uh, illustrate the power of likelihood free inference. And um, there are many tools available. And the, the tool that I'm going to um, use at the core of the method that I'm going to talk about right now is based on the, uh, the, the um, technique of reweighting. And so the idea of reweighting is I have two data sets, say one sampled from a density P of X and one sampled from a density Q of X. I want to create weights such that when I uh, have a weighted data set one, any statistic I compute should be identical to data set two. And uh, in particular, if the weights W of X are Q of X over P of X, then um, when I weight uh, data set one by this W, uh, they'll be statistically identical to data set two. So this is great, but what if I can't, uh, I, I don't and can't easily know P and Q. And, and I just told you that's the case that, that we care about because X is a very high dimensional feature space. And this is where uh, deep learning comes in. So there's a fact, which I'm happy to say more about later, um, if you're curious, is that neural networks basically learn to approximate the likelihood ratio. And so the solution is to train a neural network to distinguish the two classes, the two data sets. So one data set drawn from P and one drawn from Q. And then I directly can learn the ratio Q over P without ever knowing Q or P separately. And that's pretty amazing because it turns the problem of density estimation, the problem of trying to estimate P and Q separately, which is very hard, into a problem of classification, which is relatively much easier. Okay, and so uh, I'm gonna give uh, now an explicit example um, where uh, this reweighting technique is gonna be used. And this is really um, extremely powerful in a broad, broad variety of, of applications, but in particular for particle physics, because um, we have uh, in, our, in our collisions, there may be a variable, num a variable number of particles. And so the, the phase space is already complex. And there's also a lot of symmetry involved. And while generative models are being developed and, and there's a lot of um, effort ongoing to improve those models to be able to, to, to learn densities directly, there already are models on the market for classification to be able to incorporate all these features. So let's imagine we have some electron-positron collision and out goes some debris. Um, and I'm gonna train one of these uh, full phase space um, reweighting functions. And here, full phase space means all the, all the things you could observe in principle. So all the momenta, and the particle types. And um, just as a technical detail, we're using uh, uh, an architecture called deep sets, which is a, um, uh, a neural network um, architecture that allows, to, that allows you to incorporate variable number um, inputs that are, have permutation invariance, which is the case because our particles, there's nothing special about the, there's no way to order them um, in a unique way. And the, the particle physics um, realization of this is called the particle flow network. Okay, yeah, and to stress once again, so really uh, the simulation takes as input all the four vectors 
and um, then we'll produce a new simulation that is statistically indistinguishable from the one, my target one. Okay, so uh, there's some E plus E minus um, collisions. We perform a full phase space reweighting, and then we want to know if it worked. So it's not possible to visualize a high dimensional, high dimensional and even variable number, variable dimensional phase space. So instead, we can compute um, one dimensional observables. So uh, in this case, there's data set one, data set two. Those are like sampled from P and Q. And I'm going to learn weights to go from data set one to data set two. And that'll be the orange histogram. So the data set one is blue, the weighted data set one is orange, and then the black dashed is the target. And these are just two random observables. It doesn't matter so much what they are. They probe different aspects of the phase space. And you can see that basically the black dash and the orange are exactly the same. So that's great. Um, and the difference between these data sets here, these are, these are simulated data sets where we've just changed some parameters of the simulation. And that allows us to go to basically make a new simulation. And we've learned to mimic that with this um, neural network approach. And just to really uh, zoom in a little bit, um, in fact, uh, this works in a, in a really precise way. So the left and right set of um, columns of plots here are ratios of histograms of observables. And it doesn't matter so much, once again, what the observables are. They're just a you know, right, wide uh, range of observables. Well, I, the reason I wanted to show these plots is to illustrate um, two things. So the left plot, the um, difference between the two samples um, is this thing called uh, a lund. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a parameter in the simulation that has a very small uh, effect on the phase space, but it basically affects everything. And the point is that even though it's a small effect, um, the, the neural network is able to pick up on that. And you can see that the orange ratio, which is the reweighted um, distribution, is basically unity everywhere. So it's, it's able to detect all these subtle changes in the phase space. And the right column, it's this, the, the parameter is at the top. And once again, doesn't matter what the name is, but what it corresponds to is the transition of uh, basically the content, the strange core content of um, hadrons in a simulation. And so this thing should change absolutely nothing except for um, observables related to, strain, to, to strange hadrons. And in particular, the kaon is a strange hadron. And so the number of kaons in the event should change and basically nothing else should change. And you can see that this neural network has learned to ignore everything. So the, the orange is unity for the other three, the top three observables, which have nothing to do with strangeness. And the bottom one, which is the number of kaons. So even it's a big effect, but only a small part of phase space, and it learns to get that exactly right. So this full phase space really is that in the sense that it has all the kinematics and all the, the particle, identific, particle um, flavor um, included. But you can extend this. So this is just a discrete reweighting from one data set to another data set. So uh, what if your, your, your simulation depends not on just, um, depends on the continuous set of parameters theta? So it's not just parameter one, parameter two, it's actually a continuous family of, of parameters. And there you can easily extend this methodology by just learning a parameterized classifier. And the way you do that is you just simply add the parameters as features to the neural network, and then it learns to smoothly interpolate. So this plot on the right shows um, as a function of a parameter called alpha s, which is the basic fine structure constant of the strong force, so uh, here we've changed this parameter in the simulation. And then the blue shows the chi-squared for some observable uh, as a function of changing that parameter. So the default is 0.16. As you move away from that, you see the chi-squared gets very large because the phase space has changed. And then after reweighting, it becomes the orange. So the orange is consistent with one. And basically, it's learned continuously to be able to reweight as a function of this parameter. And once you have a continuous reweighting function, then you can ask the question, well, what about can I actually estimate the parameter from the data. And I'm just going to flash one or two slides about this. And so here you can actually use a parameterized uh, reweighting function to do parameter estimation. And the idea, um, uh, this is a little bit of a complicated equation, but it has sort of two pieces. And one piece is the data, and one piece is the simulation. And the idea is we're going to use a simulation to, to um, infer the parameters theta. And the way it works is that uh, if you just look at the log terms, this is the usual binary cross entropy. And so imagine I'm just going to train a neural network G to distinguish data from simulation. And uh, I have trained with the usual binary cross entropy. And I want to train that neural network so it's, it's as good as possible. And then we add one little bit, which is this W. So the W is a weighting function with a pre-trained, it's a pre-trained weighting function. And you see it takes as input XT, which is, um, the true value in the simulation. And basically the idea is you simultaneously, uh, as you change, and that's a parameterized reweighting function. So as you change theta, the weights change. 
And so you simultaneously learn G and theta. And the point is that um, when your weighting function is, is the correct one, so when theta is correct, the weights will be such that, it's, that the data and the simulation are not distinguishable. And so the classifier will be basically as bad as possible. And, and then you, you know that you've learned the correct theta. And so that's, that's how this, this works. You pre-train F, which is the, you know, gives you the reweighting function. Then you simultaneously train G and theta. And uh, I'll just quickly illustrate that, that it works. So here's a three-dimensional fit. Um, it uses this um, uh, alpha S, this fine structure constant of the strong force, and two other, the two other parameters I mentioned earlier. It's a three-dimensional fit, but I'm showing a two-dimensional slice. And we start at the red X. And then we run this uh, gradient descent um, uh, fitting uh, procedure. And you can see it, it very quickly converges to the green, which is the target. And then the, the colors are the, the, the likelihood contour. Uh, it's what the loss. Um, and uh, so this is pretty great. So we have a gradient descent method for doing parameter uh, estimation, where I have a non-differentiable simulator, but a differentiable uh, reweighting function. OK. So the, I now uh, motiv I motivated all this by the context of unfolding. So um, while, I, while I talk just about parameter estimation now, I now want to bring it back to the, the problem of unfolding. So parameter estimation, you, you want to estimate some you know, discrete number of parameters. But the idea of unfolding is to actually infer the full phase space. So I want to know, I want to go from de you know, my detector observable to the full distribution of, say, particles and, um, and, uh, and their momenta. And we're going to accomplish that by an iterated reweight iterated reweighting procedure that we call uh, omnifold. So the idea is that we have um, these four boxes. So the top, the top row is nature. That's like what we want to, that's what we observe on the left and what we want to know on the right. So truth is like the, that's like the pre-detector um, uh, phase space of all the hadrons. We want to infer that from the data we observe in the detector, um, which is represented by this checker pattern. Um, and we're aided in this quest, this, this quest to make the black arrow, basically, with the bottom row, which is a simulation. And in simulation, we can play God. So we know both the pre-detector part and the post-detector part. And we can use that matching um, in order to infer the black arrow. So how does this work? So the first step is to learn a reweighting, a full face space reweighting, between the simulated detector level face space and the data, the observed data. And then once we've done that, our simulation should be basically statistically identical to the measured distribution at detector level. And then we use the fact that uh, in simulation, we have a matching between the post and pre-detector. So that allows us to inherit weights at the pre-detector part, the generation level. And um, those weights are not a function, a true function of the um, pre-detector phase space, because you could have the same phase space point have multiple weights, because the weights are defined based on their detector level values. And so if we want a true function of the pre-detector phase space, we have to learn a second reweighting step to reweight between the nominal pre-detector simulation and the, the, um, the one with the weights that are inherited from detector level. And once we've learned that um, reweighting function, we now have a function on the pre-detector part. And we can push that forward to the detector level um, to inherit the weights. And we can repeat this procedure. And we can push the weights and pull back the weights and iterate many times. And at the end, the weighted um, pre-detector simulation, the generation level, will be our estimation or best estimation of the ideal, the true um, pre-detector um, phase space. And so let me just show you now uh, in a concrete example. So imagine we have um, some observable. This is called n sub so It doesn't matter what the observable is. It basically characterizes the extent to which uh, an event has two uh, two prongs of energy or one prong of energy. And uh, this histogram, the green histogram here is sort of the truth. So we, this is all simulation, but we have two different simulations, one, will, one which will act as nature and one which will act as the, you know, the simulation we would have you know, in, in a um, detector context. So this is the truth, the pre-detector part. And we also have a simulation of the detector. So we observe the black and we want to know the green. Okay. And we're aided in this quest by uh, a simulation where we have the pre-detector part that's called gen, that's this blue, and also its simulation of the detector, which is an orange. And you'll note that the blue and the green are not the same, which is pretty, it's common. I mean, our simulation uh, is good, but not um, exact. And so um, it's fine that the blue and green are not the same, but um, 
uh, the point is we can use the matching between blue and orange to basically go from black to green. And uh, the, one of the standard methods for doing this unfolding in a binned histogram is called iterative Bayesian unfolding. And um, this is another iterative uh, procedure, but it's binned and it, it gives some, some answer. It's the gray histogram here. And you can see in the ratio it has, you know, it's, this is the ratio between the gray and the green. And it's um, pretty good. Uh, you know, it's consistent within say 15% of the right answer. And on the fold um, is now in red. And uh, so on the fold here is done over the full phase space. And then afterwards we compute um, this observable and uh, also bin. So on the fold is unbinned and for all observables and we have to, we compute this observable and then bin it to compare with the other, um, the other uh, technique. And you can just see from the ratio that actually the red is closer to one um, which is possible because it uses more information in doing the unfolding, um, even though it was had access, even though it's, it's basically allowed us to unfold many observables all at once. And just to stress that, uh, here are now six plots of different observables. And it doesn't matter really what the observables are, it's a lot, of, a lot of information, but if you look at the ratio plots in all six panels, you'll see that the red is basically everywhere closer than the gray to unity, uh, or no further than um, uh, the red from unity. And uh, or the gray, and so that says that 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 um, omnifold is everywhere is nowhere worse, and in many places better than this um, IBU technique, even though um, it's you know doing it all at once. Whereas the gray is actually one per histogram because it's binned and one dimensional. So to review, um, omnifold is unbinned. It's maximum likelihood. I didn't actually prove that to you, but you can show that this iterative procedure converges to the maximum likelihood estimate in the full phase space. It's full phase space in the sense that you can compute whatever observable you like after the fact, and it improves the resolution by taking into account all the dependence and auxiliary features. Okay, so now just to, to um, summarize this uh, likelihood free part of the talk, I introduced a new method for morphing one simulation into another by a reweighting. Then I showed how you can extend that to be continuous to do parameter estimation or, and, and, and um, uh, by, by matching that with a classifier. And then I showed how you can use the morphing and iterative way to do um, unfolding, which is sort of deconvolution allows us to remove um, detector distortions in the full phase space. All right. So one question you might be asking, which is a natural question, is, is what about the uncertainties on your neural network? Which is a question I think asked by every reviewer. And I want to spend a few minutes sharpening this question, um, because I think it's quite important um, in the context of, of deep neural networks that use, that use simulation. And I think it's helpful if I use a different example than unfolding. Um, unfolding is a, is a great example, has a lot of complication, but I think in order to illustrate the, um, some of the challenges that arise, it's sufficient to use a search for new particles. Um, and so I think this makes it a little easier than the measurement case to, to show what's going on. So how does a search work in high energy physics? So roughly speaking, um, or in collider physics, so roughly speaking, um, we uh, have some uh, signal model in mind, we train a classifier in simulation um, to distinguish that signal, simulation of that signal, and our background process, which is like the standard model of particle physics. And this classifier training may or may not be a neural network, but let's say it's a neural network. In this case, um, here's a plot on the right that shows for some particular exotic Higgs boson decay, that's the signal. And uh, the neural network output is the x-axis. We define a control region at low values of the neural network output, which um, is not very sensitive to the signal. And then the complement of that is the signal region, which is supposed to be um, signal sensitive. And we use this control region to check or modify the simulation. And then we can compare the data on the modified uh, simulation in the signal region. And if they're very different, that's great. Then we have some evidence for something new. And if they're not, we can set limits on the um, production cross-section um, for this um, particular signal model. Okay, I like to think about uncertainties being broken down into sort of two pieces, or two categories. So there are uncertainties that affect the precision or optimality of the analysis. And um, if these are large, then you have used you know, bad use of our data, bad use of our time and money, but it doesn't result in a wrong result. That's in contrast to uncertainties on the accuracy or bias of the analysis, which I'll say more, a bit more about later. So what do I mean about optimality? So let's say the example from the previous page, we have, let's say, binary um, a hypothesis tests, so signal plus background versus background. In that case, there's an optimal test statistic, which is the likelihood ratio. So uh, uh, if your neural network is not the likelihood ratio, 
um, then uh, your procedure will be suboptimal. And, um, and so this is exactly what I mean um, in the context of precision or optimality. If your neural network is, is not that, then you still can be accurate, but it could be suboptimal. In contrast for um, accuracy, that, that, is, um, that is more related to um, like tail probability distribution, tail probability. So in this context, the neural network is fixed and I wanna know like what is the p-value of having a neural network above some value, um, neural network output above some value. And so here, if your predicted p-values are not the same as the true p-values, then your result will be wrong uh, or biased. And so uh, here, you could have a neural network which is optimal um, or optimal, and you could have a, a prediction which is biased or unbiased. And they're sort of, sort of uh, different um, aspects of, the, of, of this um, uncertainty. I think it's even actually more uh, complicated because I like to have four categories. So there's precision optimality on the top, accuracy bias on the bottom, and then statistical uncertainties on the left, and systematic uncertainties on the right. Um, and I'm using statistical uncertainty and systematic uncertainty because these are the, the usual words that we use and they roughly map onto other, context, other concepts um, from uh, uncertainty quantification. But I think these words are, are, are most common to, um, uh, to many of us in physics. And so now I'm gonna go through each of these boxes to describe first how we diagnose these uncertainties and then I'll say a bit more how we can reduce them. Okay, so the top left box is the uh, statistical uncertainty on precision or optimality. And this is basically due to the limited training, de training data set size. And so you can, you can estimate this um, in many ways. One simple way is, for instance, bootstrapping. You could, you could make some pseudo data sets and, uh, by resampling and then retrain. This is a bit painful because it requires retraining many neural networks, but it's relatively straightforward to do. There are a variety of um, proposals to, for instance, do this all in one go, for instance, with Bayesian neural networks. Um, but uh, conceptually, I think it's relatively straightforward to, to estimate this uncertainty. What's more complicated is the systematic uncertainty um, uh, on the, for precision or optimality. And this has sort of two parts. So one part um, is if your uh, simulation that you're using to train is not correct, um, then you will get a suboptimal classifier. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the second part uh, is about the flexibility of your network. So you know, we know that asymptotically, neural networks can approximate any function. In particular, they can approximate the likelihood ratio. But if you don't have enough flexibility in neural network training, for instance, you don't have enough layers, enough nodes per layer, you don't train for long enough, this sort of thing, then it could be that your neural network doesn't approximate the likelihood ratio. And this is hard to quantify. We sort of know what knobs are available to us, um, the things that are written here in gray, but um, it's hard to say uh, what is our uncertainty due to these um, uh, effects. Of course, you can vary some and see your sensitivity. Okay, uh, the bottom left is about the statistical uncertainty on the accuracy or bias. So this is less painful because now the neural network is fixed. So you can still estimate it, for instance, for bootstrapping. Um, and uh, um, once again, it's uh, yeah, relatively straightforward. And the main challenge, I would say, is the bottom right box, which is a systematic uncertainty on um, the bias. And so this really is about the, the, how well you, you model the density of X. And if X is high dimensional, this will be a great challenge. In some cases, uncertainty is factorized. So for instance, imagine you have some final state that has multiple particles and you know the uncertainty per particle, then you might be able to factorize the uncertainty on the phase space as an uncertainty per particle. But in many cases, we simply don't know the full uncertainty model. So that means we don't even know what are the nuisance parameters and we certainly don't know what their um, probability densities are. And this is further exacerbated um, by the fact that in the current paradigm for uncertainties, often we have you know, one or a few nuisance parameters to capture high dimensional uh, uncertainties. For instance, we might have you know, say multiple simulations and we just compare the simulations, say two simulations, and we take the differences of uncertainty. And this is uh, um, very uh, tenuous because um, we have basically one nuisance parameter to capture this high dimensional um, uh, variation. And I'm not, unfortunately I don't have a solution for this, but uh, I have at least a partial proposal for how we can at least diagnose, diag diagnose uh, the sensitivity to high dimensional um, effects. And it uses the technology from uh, the machine learning field of AI safety. Um, so if you don't know what AI safety is, it has actually a very interesting and rich literature. And one, one component of AI safety is studies what's called adversarial examples. And so the idea is, can we slightly perturb the phase space to maximally trick a neural network? And the pictures that are shown here in the context of a study that showed 
uh, you can take images and slightly modify them to make stop signs look like 40 mi 45 mile per hour signs, which is obviously a problem for self-driving cars because if you're supposed to stop but instead speed up, um, that has huge implications for um, health and safety. In our context, we, we know, or at least hope, that nature is not evil, but these tools can help us probe the high dimensional sensitivity of our neural networks if we can see, if we can slightly perturb our face space and there's a huge change in the network output, that tells us that our networks are somehow less robust than we would like them to be. And one way that we can do this uh, is, is uh, illustrated here. So imagine we have a collision event, which I'll call J. And so J here is, is one collision event and it's full high dimensional glory. So it's all the particles and their momenta. And suppose we train a classifier, a fixed classifier F, to distinguish signal from background. And then we want to learn an adversary G, which learns to map J to J goes to delta J, J plus delta J. So it's a small perturbation. And um, the first line here, the log term, basically says I want to make that perturbation such that the classifier maximally um, changes its output. And then we have some constraints. And in particular, these O of Js are some observables that we can check in the control region. And we want the perturbed uh, event to um, have only a small change in those observables because we can validate them. And so if we can have an imperceptible change from those observables point of view, but still, but still have a huge effect on the classifier, then our classifier is not very robust. Okay, so I'll just flash you one plot. So here's uh, for a particular classification task. Uh, it doesn't matter so much what it is. Uh, um, for the experts, it's boosted uh, jet tagging. And the x-axis here is the, the uh, neural network output and the, uh, uh, the threshold on that output. And the y-axis is the relative discovery significance. And you want this to be as high as possible. Um, and the orange here uses high dimensional features for the classification. And if you go from orange solid to orange dotted, that's if we just randomly perturb the phase space. So it has almost no effect on the performance. But from orange solid to orange dashed, that's this adversarial attack, this, this attack that has no, we cannot be observed because it's, it's, it preserves all the observables in the control region, but you see it has a huge drop in performance. And so this is sort of like a worst case uncertainty. It's not, I can't give a statistical meeting, but I can say that you know, this, this is, um, in, the, in absence of a, a proper uncertainty model, this gives us some, some worst case bound. Okay, so now let's return to the, the table and think about how we can reduce the various sources of uncertainty. So far, I've only told you how we can um, diagnose them. And so for the statistical ones, the, the answer is pretty clear. You, Ideally, you train with more events. This is not always possible. And in many cases, it might be that neural networks can actually help accelerate simulations or augment them to make them more effective. And I would love to talk about that, but that's for a different time. For the top right, um, it might be possible to reduce uncertainties or at least make the analysis simpler if you can make your neural network independent of known nuisance parameters. And there are a variety of techniques that have been proposed recently to decorrelate or remove your dependence on certain features or nuisance parameters. That might be better, or it also might be better in some cases to actually explicitly depend on certain nuisance parameters and profile them in data, so to constrain them in situ. And what, which one depends on you know, what the uncertainties are. Uh, but the most complicated one is about the high dimensional bias uncertainties, the modeling of the density itself. And I think that you know, we can work hard to understand the true nuisance parameters in the, you know, the high, hypervariate parameter space, and we will do this. And it will be a big challenge requiring input from many, um, many experts. And this, I think, is the biggest challenge to deploying uh, a simulation-based neural network analysis in practice. And solving it will require a lot of hard physics work. And, but in parallel, another solution is to just not use simulation. And um, this is not always possible. And of course, there are still assumptions. There is no free lunch. But, I'm now going to spend the, the, the rest of my talk discussing how we can use, we can learn directly from unlabeled data, um, and I'll, I'll give anomaly detection as my example. All right, so uh, what's the problem? Why can't I just take my data and generate some labels and learn from it? Um, and so one, uh, there, in particle physics, the, the, there are many challenges. So one is a huge data rate. So even if I had you know, an army of physicists to label, um, I would need a huge army. It would be incredibly expensive. But more fundamentally, the problem is that even a trained physicist can't look at a collision event and tell you what generated it, what happened. And that's because thanks to quantum mechanics, it's just not possible to know on an event by event basis. At best, we have um, mixed samples. So we have you know, sets of events of collisions.
superposition of, and they come to us as mixed samples. So say in this case, we have two mixed samples and they're a superposition of two different processes. So in mixed sample one, we have the green and the red process and same for mixed sample two. And they might be distinguished by a different number of um, uh, green and red. I, I would like to generate, I would like to train a classifier on these data to distinguish red and green, but I only have access to uh, other features of the events. So I can't see the color or the label, but I have access to all the other properties of the balls. And the question is, can I still learn? And the answer um, is yes. There are a variety of techniques that use less than supervised uh, training, and they, they go by the name weak supervision. And one particular technique we call classification without labels, or um, koala. And the idea is, is rather simple. So you simply um, assign labels. So you call everything in mixed sample one zero, you call everything in mixed sample two one, and you use whatever your favorite fully supervised classifier is to distinguish the zeros from ones. And you can show that actually this classifier is learning the difference between red and green, and actually asymptotically is optimal for distinguishing red and green. And this is uh, just one plot to flash that it works. So here's a rock curve where um, it has, it's in a funny particle physics orientation um, where up and to the right is better. Um, but there are five features and they're combined in a fully connected neural network in red. And that uses all the, the, feet, all the labels for all the uh, events. Whereas in black dash, it's trained in this koala mode where we only have mixed samples without any labels. And you can see that the black dash has access to way less information in the training, but has exactly the same performance. So this is just to illustrate that asymptotically, this koala approach approaches the, um, the fully supervised case. Okay, so I wanna use this for uh, anomaly detection. So can we use it when we don't even know if there is a second class in the data? And so we wanna hunt for new particles. And so we call this um, koala hunting. And to be clear, uh, this koala is uh, hunting and not being hunted. So this, is this koala in the picture is being freed. In order to set up the um, koala hunting, we need to make mixed samples. So let's think in the context of a resonance search. So imagine I'm looking for uh, an overdensity somewhere in my data. And the way I'm gonna make the mixed samples is if there is a signal, uh, I posit it to be localized somewhere. I don't have to know where it's localized, but I have to know that I have to know one dimension of my data where the signal will be localized and the background is smooth. Then I can draw uh, vertical lines, which give me my two mixed samples. There'll be a signal region and a sideband region. And then I could use other features of the events to train a koala classifier to distinguish the signal region from the sideband region. And I have to do this in sort of a smart way in order to um, not pay a big trials factor, a big look elsewhere effect. And I'm happy to say how we do that later. But basically this allows us to partition the data and generate uh, these mixed samples without having the label, the access to, to individual labels. Okay, so let me show how this works in, in uh, an example. So I'm gonna show in the context of uh, a digest search. So this picture on the left is a cross section of the Atlas detector. And uh, you can see the protons come into and out of the page and there's a collision debris goes out in all directions. And there's sort of two uh, uh, localized energy deposits in the detector. Um, they're uh, labeled in red and green and those are called jets. They're jets of hadrons. And so the idea is that the, the uh, invariant mass of these two jets be a resonance feature because if there was a resonance that produced these jets, the uh, mass would be the mass of the resonance. So it would be localized at that mass. And um, we'll use the features of the jets, so all the hadrons inside the jets, in order to train the koala classifier. And the kinds of things we're going to be sensitive to are the ones that are shown on the right, where we have some new resonance, which decays into some other new particles, which then decay into hadrons. And the structure of those um, jets could give an indication of the presence of those of, of the new, new particles. OK, so let me walk you through it. So this plot on the left shows a histogram of the invariant mass of two jets. And each blue point is a simulated um, bin of this um, MJJ, the invariant mass uh, spectrum. So the idea is that um, we can draw vertical lines to make signal region and a sideband region. We're going to scan this from left to right. And for each choice, we can uh, fit a parametric function in the um, outside the signal region. We can interpolate inside the signal region and compare to the data. So compare the interpolated red to the blue to compute p-values, to ask how consistent is the data with our prediction. And we can repeat this for uh, various thresholds on the neural network. So each of these lines corresponds to a tighter and tighter cut on the koala classifier. 
So 10% here means the 10% most signal region like events. 1% is the 1% most signal region like events, et cetera. And in each case, we fit the parametric function and we can compute p values. This plot on the right will be our ledger of p values. And uh, you see there's basically a bunch of colored uh, lines. Each one of those lines corresponds to a different cut and a p value associated to those cuts. And now I'm going to scan from left to right. As we scan, we can compute the p-values. And you see that the vertical lines, they move from left to right as the signal region moves. And the p-values in this case are all consistent with boring, which is good because we didn't inject any signal. So this is, this is necessary. If we don't inject a signal, we don't see any signal. But it's not sufficient. Obviously, we'd like to be able to be sensitive to some new physics. So in order to illustrate that, now I'll inject a signal into the data stream. And here, it's this model on the right. It's some new particle that decays into um, other particles that, that produce jets. And you can see a histogram of the invariant mass spectrum on the left. It peaks at the mass of the new particle. And it's lurking underneath this very large um, standard model background. So let's run the same procedure. In the beginning, the p-values are consistent, once again, with boring, um, when the signal region is far away from the peak of the signal. But then as I sweep the signal region from left to right, at some point, the signal region is on top of the peak. And you can see, actually, just by eye on the left plot, there's a little bump that forms in the blue. And on the right plot, this quantifies the p-value. And so we've injected something like a 1.5 sigma excess. And the neural network has really latched onto it and enhanced the excess to a 7 sigma um, p-value. As we continue to scan, um, the p-values then return to boring as the signal region passes um, beyond the peak of the signal. So just to review, um, uh, if we inject nothing, we see nothing. And if we inject a signal, we're able to enhance that signal um, uh, in order to make it uh, much more interesting and noticeable. And the signal that was injected here actually has had no search for it, dedicated search for it at the, at the LHC. But I'm happy to announce that we've done, we performed the first such search with the Atlas collision data, and it came out uh, only a couple of weeks ago. And so you're one of the first audiences to see um, this, this new result. And uh, for our first round, we kept it simple. So instead of using a high dimensional feature space, we used only a two dimensional feature space. We used um, basically only one feature per jet. And in two dimensions, um, you can just plot the neural network because it's just, in, you can re represent it as an image where the intensity is the network output. So this is just, the left plot shows the neural network um, in this two-dimensional space where the features are the masses of the two jets. And uh, it's for one particular signal region. And it has yeah, some, some structure. And on the right, um, this is what the same neural network looks like if we inject a signal at the green X. So there's a signal injected at some mass value. And you see that the neural network, the red um, part of the, the, um, the plot, has now moved to where the X is. So the network has basically automatically identified to tag the presence of that signal, even though we didn't tell it where it was ahead of time. And this is just the, the last plot I'm going to show you. Uh, it's, it's a really busy plot, but it's an it's, uh, exclusion limit. So we didn't see any, ex we didn't see any evidence for, for something new. And so we can set limits. And the way we set limits is we inject signals into the data stream and see if we would have seen them. And uh, lower values here is better, so stronger, stronger limits. And the um, various numbers correspond to different parameters of the, of the signal we injected, so the various masses. And what's really exciting is that the, the black um, squares, which are the limits from the search, are in many cases better than the existing limits, um, sometimes by um, quite a bit. And so this is really a, a, a really clear uh, demonstration, first demonstration of uh, deep learning combined with weak supervision, combined with anomaly detection to lead to real physics output. And this, I hope, is the first uh, of many. And just as a, as a fun aside, in order to make this plot, um, we had to train something like 20,000 neural networks. And I can say more later why we had to do that. OK. So now I'm, I'm getting close to the end. And I, I just want to um, say a little about, about the future. And so anomaly detection is really um, a rapidly developing area in, in collider physics. And in particular, we, in order to help facilitate this, we started what we called the LHC Olympics 2020. And you can check out our website for, for data sets, where we basically created data sets um, we don't tell the contestants what's in them, and we ask everyone to tell us. And we had the, actually the Winter Olympics in January um, at a workshop in, at NYU, and we'll have the Summer Olympics at a virtual workshop in July. And uh, I can say more about the results later. It's, uh, I think, a really great exercise for the community. But as a result of this exercise, there's been a lot of new ideas. 
And I like to categorize the new ideas in this space here, where the x-axis is the dependence of your analysis procedure on the signal model, and the y-axis is your dependence of your analysis on the background model. So most searches at the LHC, for instance, they train a classifier with or without machine learning using a simulation of both the signal and the background. That's the bottom left. And you could uh, liberate yourself from the signal or the background. And these new methods are trying to liberate ourselves from both. So today I told you about Koala, but there are a variety of other ones that have uh, similarly silly names like Salad and Anode. And um, uh, this is really a, a really uh, a rapidly growing area. OK, so that really brings me to the end. Today I told you about um, uh, a variety of topics starting from simulation-based learning to access the full face space. And I gave you the example of Omnifold for full face space unfolding. I then um, took a detour to talk about uncertainty on simulation-based inference and about the difference between optimality and optimality uncertainties and bias uncertainties. And then I discussed a technique to maybe uh, bound the most challenging uh, uncertainty related to bias uncertainties in high dimensions. I then talked about how we can learn directly from unlabeled data and I introduced the koala approach to weak supervision. And I, I demonstrated its, its applicability using anomaly detection and showed that it's actually been used, already deployed uh, uh, in collision data for the first time. And now I'm really at the end. So I think deep learning has a, a great potential to enhance, accelerate, and empower analysis in high energy physics. I've only given you a selection <laughs> due to the limited time, but really this is a, <clears throat> a rapidly expanding area. I think now the full face space of our experiments is explorable. Um, but we need to be cautious about new challenges that arise, um, for instance, in uncertainty quantification in, in high dimensions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, ben, uh, I would like to be the first one to thank you for this wonderful lecture. And I think uh, the people attending the seminar will join you uh, perhaps by virtually clapping or saying something. Um, I think we have uh, some time for questions. and. Uh, I uh, would like uh, everybody to uh, perhaps uh, just uh, uh, jump in or, uh, or or raise a hand, whatever you prefer. So could I ask about your unlabeled search for new physics in Atlas? Uh, if you'd have found something, would you have had to go and do a sort of conventional analysis in order to convince your colleagues that it was really there? Would they have been happy with your um, unlabeled 20,000 neural network result? So I would like to person. I would like to think that if we had discovered something, you know, we, we did a um, uh, an extensive set of of uh, validations to ensure that this result is robust. And the reason that we have so many neural networks is exactly for that reason. They contribute to the robustness and the validation. And I think I think it would have been convincing. Um, at the same time. Um, of course, one of I think of these um, this this kind of approach, especially its generalization to higher dimensions, as sort of a, an alarm system. So in here we can visualize the neural network output because it's only in two dimensions. But if you have say a twenty, hundred, or thousand dimensional neural network, it's not possible to, to easily visualize it except in slices. And so I think of it like this procedure allows us to say there is a region of phase space which is suggestive of something new. And of course, you can query the neural network. It's just a function to ask where in the phase space did it find something new. But it would be great, of course, to follow up with a dedicated analysis that sort of focuses on that region of phase space. Although, strictly speaking, in order to discover that there is something new, this procedure should be valid. Um, yeah, go ahead, Danielle. Sorry. Uh, hi, Ben. I just want to thank you also for uh, starting to put the issue of uh, uncertainties in the discussion of neural networks, which I think is very important. I, I certainly agree. I think um, it's, uh, I don't have, like I said, I don't have all the solutions, but I think at least, um, hopefully we, we can at least say what the problems are. And if we work together, yeah. I think there's a real, real potential to make progress. Yeah, I really think that is important. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I just had a brief uh, follow-up question from, from Louis' question. Um, it seems that if you had um, a dedicated search for a particular model, right, then that would work better or at least uh, maybe, maybe the same as the, um, uh, the uh, anomaly detection. Uh, I guess, yeah, the, in the plot that you just shown, um, the dedicated search, yeah, okay. 
if you need it is better. Um, I mean, here it's not quite fair because the dedicated search actually uses more than two features. And so if we used more features in the anomaly detection search, the black would go down. But I suspect that the, that the X would be better. And um, if you know what you're looking for exactly, you should definitely use a supervised approach. It will be better. However, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's good to be broadly sensitive. So for instance, this X you, you see here, it has no sensitivity away from the one it searched for. So it's only sensitive to the very narrow region of face space it was targeted, it was you know, designed for, and away from that has no sensitivity. And you could say, well, why don't you just scan over all the face space? I mean, you could literally just say, pick every possible signal model and train a you know, classifier for each one. And you could do that. And for each individual one, it would be better than, than the anomaly detection one. However, you'd pay a huge trials factor because you're conducting an enormous number of, of um, hypothesis tests. And one can show that in the case, in this anomaly detection case, you don't pay any uh, trials factor in, the only trials factor you pay is for the scan in the resonance feature. And all the other features you use for classification, you don't pay a trials factor. I see, thanks. Very good. Um, if there are no further questions, we should uh, thank Ben again for this wonderful lecture. And uh, I hope to see most of you next week for the next lecture in the series. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity.